CEE Central Europe Explained An IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group Episode 9 Becoming an EU member with Mihai Razvan Unguria Hello and welcome to CEE Central Europe Explained. I'm Sebastian Schaffer, Managing Director at the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe in Vienna. Today, I'm very glad to welcome Mihai Razman Unguriano, the former Prime Minister, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and former Director of the Foreign Intelligence Service in Romania. Hello, Mihai. Hello, Sebastian. I'm so glad to be here with you and hopefully with those who are paying attention to what we say. I'm sure they will. Thank you very much for agreeing to this. It's a perfect fit to our topic today because you have witnessed actually the Romanian state becoming a member of... I, had, I signed the treaty. <laughs> even, even more so. I think we could not have found a better person to talk about our topic today, which is becoming an EU member, the case of Romania, Bulgaria and also Croatia. We're going to focus a little bit on um, the challenges that uh, becoming a EU member brings to the country, but also to the Union. And uh, we also uh, will talk a little bit about what uh, will change in the accession process and what needs to change and what the future perspectives are. So, Mia, Romania, you mentioned you signed the treaty entering the European Union. Uh, in January 2007, Romania joined during this fifth round of enlargement together with the neighboring country, Bulgaria. How did you perceive it? And also, maybe, why was it 2007 and not 2004 with the Big Bang enlargement? Uh, uh, well, let me start on the foot of subjectivity first. Because, I would say, like the majority of my fellow countrymen, I interpreted this process of stepping into the European Union and NATO as well as a sort of a historic vengeance upon the last 50 years of communist rule in Romania. And this was very much also the, the atmosphere and the common interpretation of uh, Central and East European countries, former members of the Soviet bloc, joining the two large families, transatlantic and European families. It was like uh, a sort of a, um, um, a journey back to Europe, to civilized Europe, after wandering for almost half of a century through the very dark forests of Soviet rule and communism. So and this is what I felt like. And please don't laugh at me, but I was thinking of my ancestors, of my grandparents, uh, of what my family underwent through communism and how we were basically hatched down to any to, to nothing, to the million of lives that have been lost since the uh, end of the Second World War, either in concentration communist communist concentration camps or forced labor camps and so on and so forth. Anyway, so if, me, I, if I just may yeah. add to this. Um, because it's very interesting. Uh, would you? It's emotionally heavy, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. yeah. It was then. It is yeah, still now. Yeah. I, I imagine. So um, when when you talk about your ancestors and your family, would they have imagined that that something like this would happen in two thousand and seven? Um, that this would be possible. Well, this is a good question because on my mother's side, on my father's side, my grandparents were all absolutely convinced the Americans will save us in 45. Mm -hmm. And they waited, into inverted commas, they waited for the Americans to save Romania from the claws of the Soviet Union till 47, 48, when the first waves of arrests whipped Romania and cleared the society of its elite, politi maybe political, academic, or whatever else. So until 48, there was, there was a hope with capital letter. After 1948, there was just a prison. Romania, like Bulgaria, like Hungary, like Czechoslovakia at the times, Poland, needless to say, they all replicated the gulag, the Soviet gulag system, 
And those countries became prisons, embodiments of prisons for their own nations. Imagine that we had no possibility of leaving the country. Exile was impossible. The pressure of the political police, the political secret police, was extremely high. And when 1989 came, there was a watershed. We could not believe our eyes about what was happening there, because after 50 years of, of harsh rule, one would develop a sort of a variant of the famous Stockholm Syndrome. So you get accustomed to it. Right. Like you get accustomed with your misery, with your poverty, with your uh, very limited choice of personal freedoms, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so when I put my signature on the accession treaty, I was not just happy, I thought of myself, and please, it's no sign of arrogance on my side. I thought of myself as I would have been favored by God himself. And it is going through that very signature, which basically is a physical act, that the treat itself loaded the text with a huge symbolic importance, with a huge symbolic weight. And none of us, those who signed, neither me or Ivai Lokalfin, who was my Bulgarian counterpart, for example, and who's a good friend of mine, we were not thinking about um, a miraculous solution that was happening back in 2005. It was no miraculous cure to the problems that got accumulated in five decades of communist rules, but it was the first step of the first steps towards acquiring a different kind of society. And we were at that time, nevertheless, because we had a minor but important experience with NATO membership. We acknowledged, maturely acknowledged, the transformational power of the European Union. Because we were absolutely convinced that Romania and Bulgaria, like Hungary or Slovakia or Czech, the Czech Republic or Poland before us, we would not have the inner capacities and energy to transform the country into its best variant that would resemble a country member of the European Union. Uh, and at the same time, we felt the pressure of history behind us. It was, was what Francis Fukuyama told us, mm -hmm. that Western liberal democracies are the happy ending of this post-Hegelian kind of, of transformation of our world. And we were happy with this. We thought, okay, it's not a miraculous cure, will not get rid of all these cancers that are inbuilt yeah, in, the, in the social or the cultural fabric, will not solve the problems of authority contents, but that's the first step. And then we, there'll be pleasure, pressure from, from, from the European Union itself would help us transform the country to something else. In 2013, nevertheless, with the accession of Croatia, a country that was ravaged by the Yugoslav Wars, only two decades before 2013, that was the moment when this transformational capacity of the European Union ended. And this is paradoxical, but this is just a bit of history in a minute. That was the moment when the accession gates were closed for whatever was left east of Poland and Romania. Ukraine, the Republic of Moldova, they tried somehow to wind their political roads into a sort of an accession program that would resemble enlargement, or semi-enlargement, but they were refused, point blank, to join the European Union. And that was the case also with Russia. So that was the moment when the, the, the transformative power of the European Union ended, 2013. What's been left till our days, our COVID days, there's nothing clear about enlargement. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, maybe here, although <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Um, I still want, would want to focus on the point, why did it take three years longer in Romania? And how did actually the situation in Romania change after the accession? 
which were improvements that are visible. Ah, well, there is a story here. I don't know whether I'm allowed to, to talk about it, but nevertheless, Oli Rehn was commissioner for enlargement at the time, yeah. and with whom I was and still am befriended. He's a very nice chap himself. His opinion was that Romania and Bulgaria were not exactly prepared, and if you go to Brussels, you could still hear people who'd say, you were taken in at the moment, you were not ready to join the European Union, which is, which is not an objective academic conclusion that comes out from sets of arguments. It's very much something subjective, and it's a sort of a post hoc kind of judgment determined by the last years we witnessed the European Union dwindling down. So it's a, it's a logical fracture. The truth is that none of the countries, neither Central European countries, the fourth wave, nor the fifth wave countries, Romania and Bulgaria, but even Croatia later on, none of them would have been prepared in the sense of, let's say, idealistically committing them to the so-called Copenhagen criteria. None of them. The problem is not even Greece would have been ready to join the European Union, speculating about this, that let, you know, supposedly Greece would have been in a position that during the Euro crisis would have joined, you know, wholeheartedly the European Union. Not even Greece was prepared. Not even Spain after Franco was prepared. Although we didn't have Copenhagen criteria. That, was, that is the yeah. issue. The more, the more we go into the temporal contents of the first two decades of year 2000s, the more the number of these criteria gets larger and, in a way, conditionalities start picking upon each other into far more substantive, a substantive way. And this is, this is what brings us now to the lessons. Mm -hmm. I would not say they're specifically uh, uh, tailored for Romania, but actually for all the countries in, belonging to the fourth and the fifth waves. Now, let me put it again. What was the driving force behind membership? Was the attraction for an open market society, for a space of freedoms, open society, a liberal democracy, for stability, which was the cornerstone of the membership, of the membership drive, social drive, prosperity, which was the direct economic and social product of stability, yeah? for good governance that would have been learned when other countries could have teach it. And last but not least for personal freedom. The completion of personal freedom with the human individual at the center of the four conceptual freedoms. Now, Oli Rehn was not happy with this. Nevertheless, France was acting in such a way that Romania and Bulgaria, as members of the Organisation de la Francophonie, had to be taken in. Well, that was a so-called semi-official reason. The truth is that both Romania and Bulgaria were initially designed to join the European Union in the fourth wave. And then, because there was a need to reinforce institutions, the rule of law, and readapt or build institutions that would peer their counterparts in the European Union, they were left for one year off, basically. And this is one of the reasons why the so-called cooperation and verification mechanism came forth. Because there was a sort of a symbolic perception at the time that Romania and Bulgaria were the den of corruption and almost, well, whatever bad Sodoma and Gomorrah might have had, where everything was piled in that very dark, lurky corner of Southeastern Europe, which is not true. On the other hand, it was that time when we all started witnessing the coming uh, in power of large anti-European and Eurosceptic forces, political forces. But also the financial and economic crisis. 
2025. Yes, yeah. in, in a couple of years, basically, in 2009. But anyway, that was, that was the circumstance. Mm -hmm. I, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, I did a lot, not my, just myself, but with my colleagues in the cabinet and my, with my colleagues in different ministries, we did a lot to dispose of all this kind of, let's say, uh, frowning looks mm -hmm. about Romania and Bulgaria. And we succeeded. In the end, there was no, no forced push. Romania and Bulgaria are quite important members in terms of political weight and economic substance, serious members of the European Union. And although they look in a way shaky when it comes to institutional development or uh, to the rule of law, corruption and stuff, they're not. They're just advancing, but here is the trick. They're advancing in their own rhythm. Mm -hmm. It's not in the rhythm or alongside the score other important members and older members of the European Union would have wished to. Mm -hmm. Because marvels cannot happen in one day. Right. Geopolitical perspective is also that, of course, it brought the Black Sea region directly into the European Union with uh, the Black Sea coastline, and uh, you mentioned also already the geographical uh, implications coming out from this. But when we also look on uh, the further enlargement that you have mentioned, do you think it pushed back this experience, the accession of Croatia? Would have Croatia joined earlier if? the experience with uh, um, joining and the perception that you, that you described with Romania and Bulgaria within the other EU members would have not been like this? Let me put it in a nutshell. Central Europe and Eastern Europe were not exactly sampling the experience, the political transformation experience of, the other, of all the other members of the European Union. And there is a time gap between the third and the fourth waves of enlargement. That time gap supersedes a gap coming from the change of political generations. At the level of parliamentary and executives, contents in the, let's say, elder EU members. So what, what happened then, prior to the fourth wave of enlargement, was a phenomenon that we can still feel its effects today. A new generation of political elite came to Brussels or in power in different capitals of the Western world. A generation that had never known what the Second World War was about, that had no idea what was the, the so-called primary effect of the coal and, and steel community back in the late 1940s, what was the Monet effect and why was it important at that time, have economic ties first and economic ties and cooperation would then make forces of revisionism and militarism fade out. Yeah? That was the Monet effect. Um, and, and, and finally, generations, a generation that was middle-aged, talking about early 2000s, that had no idea, no interest, and in a way no academic substance about imagining what the empire of evil was about. With no understanding of this, because they were born in a safe, in a secure political environment, in their universities, in their institutes of research, and the Brussels, which was not in a position to develop any foreign policy tools, may they be strategic or economic, with Moscow, what was laying east of the former DDR border was something, you know, like in the early medieval maps of Africa, Hicks und Leones. This is where lions are, and that was it. And there was a fence, not the fence of Berlin, not the wall of Berlin, but a fence that people could see each other, but can no, could not trade politically to each other. That was what happened in 2004. It was, in a way, against the very uh, contents of, the, of political life in the European Union at the time. The European Parliament was very powerful. It was for the first time when the European Parliament asserted its power and played a heavy role in the enlargement process. 
uh, and it was heavy mostly because the new political, national political parties represented from the new member countries, represented in the European Parliament, gave life to the uh, EPP, who was a bit reluctant about enlargement, but with a horde of political appointees or elected representatives from Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, all of them very noisy and very persuasive and coming with the same narrative of we have to avenge the communist period, la 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 la, mm -hmm. they succeeded to put the parliament along the line of conduct mm -hmm. and made the European parliament a, a powerhouse of, of enlargement. And that was pretty critical in determining the European Commission to stay on the course mm -hmm. and not to, you know, just to pick up phones and call Berlin or Paris or London and say, well, what are we going to do now? Yeah, thank you so much. We're already at the end of our talk. And I haven't said, I haven't said anything. Uh, you have said a lot, actually, <laughs> because I have tons of episodes already in my mind that we could follow up with this, hopefully also with you, because from the end of the end of history to the insertion of identity politics into the European Parliament, which also happened for the first time when Romania and Bulgaria joined, to the development of the accession process with the lessons learned, but also one of the most important takeaways that I have from our talk together here is that basically we, of course, we need certain rules for accession, but the stricter we reform this process, the longer the process will take, and it doesn't do any good for the countries that are, so to say, at the doorstep. So my last and, and final brief question to you would be, what do you think will change in the future of enlargement if we continue this course? Out of a lot of lessons that I've learned <laughs> or went through, I would just finger point at three of them. Mm -hmm. The first is that democratic transition would not ever guarantee the good governance mm -hmm. on one hand and is not a one-way political street. Mm -hmm. This is the first. And we see what's happening in countries like Poland and Hungary. Yeah? The second is that like all political strategies of the European Union, enlargement, the larger process, if there is a drive behind him, needs clarity, consistency, and confidence. If we keep Turkey off the European Union at the doors, what we show is that we are weak in our own choices. There is no confidence. There is no, there is no clarity either. But there is no confidence into doing it. The consistency is that Turkey is the eldest candidate yeah. to the European Union. Yeah. I mean, it becomes a sort of an old Egyptian kind of time measurement. Uh, it's, yeah. it's about the pyramids now. Yeah. And third, which is pretty important, is that we need to help building a culture of reform mm -hmm. and a culture of support for the European Union. And we need the public. It's not an elite-driven process. Now it's a very social process. Mm -hmm. The more we go into the migration stuff, the more public the policies of the European Union become. And this is quite tricky and it's important. And the last one, never take in a country with deep domestic divides. Mm -hmm. And that was the case of Cyprus. Thank you very much, Mihai. It was my pleasure. Um, thank you very much to everyone for listening. This was CEE Central Europe Explained, becoming an EU member, an IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group. We are looking forward to the next episode, and Mihai, we are looking forward to the next talk in whatever format we have. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. IDM Podcast. Institute für den Donauraum und Mitteleuropa. Institute for the Danube region and Central Europe. European perspectives. Regional actions. Cooperation and expertise since 1953.